Thanks very much, Ali. Thanks for having me. Uh, thanks to Wadham for this uh, series. I'm uh, excited to be part of it. Uh, so I'll get started. Um, um, so I'm going to talk today about preparing and planning for recreational um, substances at <clears throat> music festivals. I'm going to talk about everything uh, a bit from public health to, to critical care because I think they're both important uh, uh, functions for festivals and for mass gatherings in general. And uh, it certainly hopefully combines a lot of the interests at Wadham. So I don't have any conflicts to declare other than that I'm a paid medical director at a single festival here. I do occasional work at other festivals as well. I'd like to acknowledge uh, some people that I've done some publishing with, uh, Adam, uh, Sheila Ferdos, and Allison, um, Ali, and um, also to the festival uh, for the medical and harm reduction teams and the awesome work that they do, and uh, they're a big, great bunch to work with. So. As an overview, I'm going to talk uh, basically in two parts. The first part is about music festivals and substance use. I'm going to give a bit of an overview and literature review in terms of the prevalence, uh, importance of substance use, the motivations for it, the risk factors, and the patterns of substance use at music festivals uh, specifically. And then uh, talk a little bit about mass gathering health. And so a bit more of a public health approach to things uh, in terms of the risks of the substance use and for harm, and then interventions for improving the outcomes uh, with respect to those harms. And use the chain of survival model, which uh, has been described already, uh, some of my Canadian uh, co-conspirators, and um, talk a little bit about preventive care and medical care at uh, mass gatherings and music festivals, and then talk a little bit again about public health in general uh, as a more overarching principle. So uh, I'm just going to put a few caveats out there first. Uh, first of all, it's limited research. Uh, it's predominance of case studies. It's more experience-based and evidence-based, and it's really emerging as conceptual frameworks uh, only in the past several years. Uh, variable definitions and taxonomy make it difficult for us to speak a common language, and comparisons can be difficult because definitions are not always... Uh, uh, homogeneous. Uh, that's evolving dynamically alongside events as they change over time as well. So we're trying to catch up. And then the idea, again, public health versus medicine and, and the collaboration, um, that's a, a question of taxonomy and, and arrangement of services. Uh, and then again, legal and cultural relevance. I'm talking to people from what I understand that are from a number of uh, hemispheres and uh, and different places and different uh, legal and cultural uh, limitations and considerations. So I will give a bit of a Canadian biased uh, conversation, but I hope that that will be taken into account. In terms of music festivals, um, the definition here uh, is uh, from just from Google, but um, it's often undefined in the literature. There's mixed meanings. It can be single day, it can be multi day, it can have different genres, durations, inside, outside. Uh, the only clear definition that I saw for the, the term was in Westerl's paper recently uh, and said that if there's multiple stages, it's a, a music festival. So I've included all music events in this discussion and tried where possible to indicate those people who've indicated as a festival, even though it isn't necessarily uh, a strict definition. Uh, festivals are were at least uh, increasing and it probably hit market saturation the past couple of years uh, with um, the decline of things uh, um, due uh, to over, over um, essentially oversubscription of, of companies and things. So uh, mass gatherings on the whole, substance use affects uh, all mass gatherings and music festivals aren't, aren't exclusive to that. There isn't a lot of literature specifically on substance use other than it being a risk factor for mass gatherings. Uh, so I'm gonna focus specifically on music festivals and substance use effects there, but I think uh, probably they're, they're um, you know, corollaries in terms of other mass gatherings as well that would be worth looking at in future research. So music festivals uh, are a subset of mass gatherings that have known um, risk factors uh, for presentation at, at health services and need for care. Uh, they're a music event by definition. That's its own risk factor. They have a high ambient temperature. They're a young crowd. Crowd's mobile. Crowd's dense. Crowd's mood is pretty elevated. It's bounded almost always. It's got uh, long duration. It's outdoor location. And there's a presence of drugs and alcohol, which is the focus today. So in terms of the specific drugs, I'm going to talk up on the left here, uh, not very much about tobacco, to be honest. Alcohol, because it's legal. Uh, depending on your jurisdiction, cannabis may or may not be legal. We're actually in the process of a transition into the yellow zone here in Canada. And then illegal substances, cocaine, MDMA, ketamine, GHB, LSD, psilocybin, amphetamine, uh, opiates, benzos, and others, including the novel uh, um, psychoactive substances uh, that are, that are um, making an appearance now. 
more recently. So you can't really understand uh, substance use uh, without understanding people's motivations for things. And, and, and in terms of interventions, you need to understand why people do things. So in the literature, essentially people go to festivals and use substances for a number of different reasons, but in general, identity, status, sense of difference is important, bonding, socialization, social capital uh, has been identified, functional catharsis, being able to kick back and get away from your everyday, uh, both through the festival presence and, and using substances. The use itself enhances music and your experiences. Uh, and it's generally young people in their developmental phase uh, in, in adolescence with profound physical, emotional, and intellectual changes. And then interestingly, there seems to be a, a correlation with um, uh, several um, mental health indices of anxiety, obsessive compulsion, depression, um, and probably music festival attendance potentially, but certainly substance use uh, where uh, maybe uh, self-medication to some extent or maybe predisposing you to use. So the theory of planned behavior, which is uh, proposed by Asgen and, and introduced to me uh, by, uh, by Ali uh, Hutton, um, uh, is that people are planning to, to do a behavior and they have a strength of, of their planning, uh, their plan to do that, uh, that is, um, that's variable. And so you're, you're, the strength of that plan, which is likely what's gonna happen, the evidence shows that the plan is the most likely gonna be the actual case of how people behave, um, that um, the, the strength of that plan determines whether you can intervene and, and change uh, behavior or change outcomes. And so um, it's important to understand that. And so we just recently co um, collaborated on a, a publication talking about developing public health initiatives through understanding the motivations of the audience and, and music uh, events were a subset of these. Um, and uh, to, to sort of back this up, it's unpublished data from 2015 at a gate of an electronic dance music festival of uh, 15,000 attendees where uh, their plan of use was described as 48% planning to use alcohol, 78% planning to use cannabis, and 93% planning to use an uh, other than uh, alcohol or cannabis substance. And so you can see going in the going in the gate, going in the door of, of this, uh, the 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 um, event itself, that you're you're already up against a significant um, plan of, of high intensity use. So what about epidemiology of substances? Where do we get our data from? Well, it can be self-reported. People can tell you about their planned use, as I described. They can report their use to a, to a survey or directly to a, a service, like, like your physician taking care of them. More often than not, they're, they're not able to, and their friend reports it on, on their behalf. Um, you could be directly doing testing on the patient, blood, urine, uh, buccal swabs, uh, hair uh, is more delayed, but can be done as well. Most of them, that doesn't change your management, but, but can be useful just from a purely epidemiological and, and explanatory standpoint. In terms of direct testing of substances, there are assays that exist, especially in the dance culture. Um, uh, and um, you can use mass spectrometry, gas liquid chromatography, and other more novel, uh, uh, as, as amplified here, ATR, FTIR spectrometry, uh, which I'm not even sure what it is. And it's, uh, it's detecting some of the new uh, novel uh, psychoactive substances. Uh, direct testing is another possibility uh, through aggregate data. So you can see here at Ross Kilda, they basically uh, ho hooked up to the end of the latrines there and, and through water, uh, you know, wastewater or um, pooled urine uh, as another option uh, to check what people are using. And, and more recently, this past year or two, you've seen social media campaigns where uh, people are, f are, are checking out aggregate data. And so this is an example of Instagram checking out uh, who's mentioning drug names or drug uh, references and uh, uh, music festivals. And it did a correlation, which I'll talk about a little bit later, but a uh, great way to get your data. Certainly a lot easier than uh, entering it or analyzing it yourself. Uh, so the more we can do that, the better, as far as I'm concerned, make things a lot easier. So what about substance use? I mean, we know that age and gender contribute to that. Alcohol is most prevalent across all ages and, and both genders, but illegal substance use is increased in younger age and decreases in older age. There are cultural delays. People tend to be uh, exhibiting longer adolescent type behavior, if I could put it that way. Um, and so, you know, drug use may be becoming more prevalent because of that. Um, Males are always using a little bit more. Uh, their odds ratio is 0.55 for all drug types, no matter what it is. But that gap seems to be narrowing, which may be um, a reflection of, of females' um, um, uh, independence or exerting their independence or, 
or uh, changing their roles in, in, in society and being able to, to, to venture out and participate in what were typically male-dominated behaviors. Uh, the information for this comes from general public and festival surveys, and there is an overrepresentation of Australia, US, Canada, and Europe in, in the data that I have overall. So what are some of the factors in substance use? Um, it turns out music festivals uh, right at the base are, are, are uh, uh, positive uh, for um, calorie, a risk factor for substance use, which we know in the mass gathering literature, right? But if you look at the NDSHS, was in Australia as a baseline uh, population study of, of who uses um, substances. As part of that study, they showed that music festival has any drug, has a, a 2.5 times more likely to use any drug just by virtue of you going to a music festival. So it's an independent predictor and that marijuana is the most common uh, of the drugs that are being used. If you look at you know uh, more rare drugs or, or certainly more exclusive drugs like heroin, the relative risk is, is three times for heroin, but it's really only a small amount uh, difference for music festivals. Whereas you look at things like ecstasy, it's gone up by more than five times the amount of baseline prevalence, but has also gone up by a 19% amount. So, so a music festival has a, has differential effects on different uh, uh, drugs. So, if you look at alcohol in males, this is interesting too. So, festivals and other high social venues, they they investigated negative consequences at those and, and tried to find associations between alcohol use and negative consequences. Those were defined as unprotected or unintended sex or uh, aggression, assault, or involvement of law enforcement. And they found that even when they adjusted for peer influence, alcohol volume that people took, their personalities, their sociodemographics, that it, it, there are independent effects on drinking location uh, in terms of severe alcohol uh, related, negative alcohol related consequences, which I think is interesting from a, from a music festival point of view because the, the, uh, the medium itself uh, can actually change things. If you look at genres of music, um, so in 2008, this was a review showed that alternative and pop were both uh, odds ratios below one, meaning that they were less likely to use any drug if you're an alternative or pop um, festival uh, or music preference, pardon me. And that if you look at dance and house, that was only statistically significant for any drug, so for um, yeah, any drug at all. Uh, but if you look at the rest of them uh, for you know marijuana, ecstasy, amphetamines, LSD, cocaine, both dance music and rap music uh, had positive uh, odds ratios uh, greater than one but uh, were not completely statistically significant for rap so those two genres seem to be the ones that people have preference for uh, they're more likely to be involved in drug use so the odds ratio a few extra interesting things for any substance it's 2.47 uh, for dance so you're more likely if you're in, into dance music for any substance again and with rock it's protective again there appears to be a negative correlation between alcohol and harder rave drugs um, which may be protective since uh, you know poly substance use can be risky in that in in those drugs association between music and substance use remains significant after including covariates in our models and differences in music preferences accounted for a substantial part of the variation in adolescent substance use and some music preferences were a significant robust and unique marker of adolescent substance use for both genders across Europe and I think we see that in terms of the kinds of festivals uh, and the, the patterns of presentations uh, clinically and, and in terms of drug use important to note that poly substance use in the in the dance scene is a particularly important consideration uh, electronic dance you're seeing in the 25 to 65 percent um, presentations at medical care where there's been poly substance use so this is the results of that Instagram and you can see on the right hand side green this is for all festivals each line is a different festival uh, and the names on the left on the right uh, it shows that alcohol is the most common substance uh, with that sort of uh, aquamarine uh, turquoise green and then and then the, the more um, uh, sea green is marijuana and you can see that Marley Fest the second from the bottom is really quite a predominance of, of people sending Instagrams with words about marijuana and Marley Fest at the same time. If you look at the electronic ones so the top two electronic Daisy Carnival Ultra Music Festival and then lower down uh, towards the bottom Mad Decent Block Party who have all had deaths associated with uh, electronic dance music in the past several years you can see that the, the MDMA uh, which is brown and cocaine, uh, gray and, and, and silver for the, the more novel, novel and dance uh, rave type drugs, uh, really concentrated. So I, I wish data collection would all be done by Instagram because this is such a great representation, all the things I'm trying to say. And all they had to do is put their ear to the ground for people who are already talking. So uh, outcomes, how do we measure them? Well, for medical, we, we measure morbidity, we measure mortality, we, remember, we, we measure hospital transports. 
uh, for operational success, uh, we, we say, well, was it financially good for the, for the promoter? Were the attendees enjoying it? Were there no headlines? I'd like to add to that that there's some post-event, which are more public health considerations that need to now consider important outcomes in terms of the interventions that we do at these festivals because they may affect sort of more generalized behaviors outside the event, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, time and space. Patient presentations. I'm just going to review quickly our volume metrics and talk because we're going to talk about those in terms of the effects that uh, alcohol and substances have on those. So um, basically, your, your patient presentation rate is your chance, if you're an attendee, of moving into the medical space. So um, it's basically essentially a surrogate of the your risk of becoming a patient, right? And uh, the PPTA is your percentage of patients transported uh, by ambulance, and that's essentially if you're, what's your probability of being a patient and then having to go to hospital? And that's per hundred. And that's normally a reflection of how good your onsite care is able to deal with things and uh, prevent hospital transports. And then there's your ATR, often sometimes called the, the TTHR, or the transport to hospital rate, ambulance transfer rate. And that's essentially, what's the overall risk for your event? Like how many, uh, per thousand people, how many people are going to hospital? So in the public literature, there are predictive models for need uh, in terms of your PPR, so you need to be able to manage that volume that shows up. Um, they vary greatly as described for all mass gatherings, and we know that it, it's, uh, it, it takes a significant amount of energy to, to model that uh, well and, to, to, and accurately, and there's a lot of energy being put into that. Nonlinear modeling is being used more recently, uh, and in the future probably to find a smaller list of independent variables. For electronic dance music festivals, PPRs are quoted as 8 to 20 per thousand. Uh, and certainly the festival that I work at uh, is in roughly that range, 20 to 22, uh, depending on whether you include people coming for Band-Aids and that sort of stuff in your patient presentation can, can significantly uh, affect things. So definitions can, can affect things. And there's also risk factors that can affect things. And then overall, there's a pretty general understanding that cases are 80 to 95% minor uh, at music events which I think is important because the, the majority of what you're doing is that. And if it's only 10%, to what what percent of that those major cases uh, are they represented by substance use? Because that's what we're concerned about. So how many presentations of those PPRs, the people that come to, to, your, to your services, are due to intoxications? And unfortunately, it's not as easy as saying how many people came and how many were intoxicated for a number of reasons. But to get into that just briefly, the difficulty is that substances are used by people who are not coming uh, for their primary complaint. And so people aren't asking, this isn't being represented granularly in the data that's being collected. Um, and uh, on top of that, the people who are using substances and are also coming for their chief complaint and not just intoxicated, but came in for a separate reason, some of them are here for their reason, like they're unconscious and it's due to alcohol and drugs, uh, or um, they might be indirectly there because they had a laceration because they were stumbling or they had dehydration because they were a bit intoxicated and they weren't uh, hydrating properly as a secondary effect. So those things don't get uh, accurately captured. But what do we know? Because we have sort of a smattering across the literature of different subsets of this kind of circle diagram. So total presentations, we know that it's been quoted that, that those double with alcohol sales uh, and also that they're affected by alcohol and drug use in general. And that's, I think, pretty well recognized, okay? But what about total presentation to chief complaint? And that's where the person has said that the chief presenting complaint was intoxication. Uh, and so there are some music festivals, again, these are noted on the right-hand side. Some are music festivals, some aren't. Um, but, you know, in the music festivals, like uh, Stagelin was um, in, in uh, Roskilde, I think, and Sjelde was in Norway, and uh, um, Ali did a, pre did a look at Aussie, uh, you see 1 in 2% and then 66%. And so the inclusion or perhaps the clinical acumen or perhaps the, the, the representation is, is kind of a, a bit all over, um, but there's a pretty big difference. Um, so... Uh, this is a festival that I uh, uh, attend, and so I wanted to point out that I did a, a three-year sample of uh, about 8% of the total presentation, so pretty close to the 10% minor that we see as well uh, in altered mental status. And so of 4,000 presentations, 330 over the three years were for altered mental status, and, and this, is, this was their, their self-reported 
uh, use and the number of substances that they use. And so you can see that half of people are using two to four or more substances and that the most common GHB followed by alcohol, followed by MDMA, um, uh, which is sort of within norms. Uh, what else can we say about the effects of toxicology, uh, sorry, of uh, substance on <clears throat> your, your presentation rate? So you can see here, this is a recent, uh, uh, really interesting uh, case by um, uh, Westerl et al. Uh, in 2017 published. 403 concerts in New Jersey over the past 11-ish years till 2015, 2.4 million total attendees. The far right-hand side is alcohol and drug as the nature of the medical emergencies. You can see that it's a significant, if not one third or better of all presentations are uh, alcohol or drug related. That's not just that they took, but are alcohol and drug related. So what about total presentations of substances used? There's only a couple of those quoted. Um, Friedman uh, has mentioned it at, at EDM in, in New York City, but that was on people with abnormal vitals. So it might be a little bit higher, but the, on abnormal vitals, about 50% of them had used substances. Uh, for another, I forget what the festival was, but I think it was more hard, um, sort of classic hard rock, 15.6% uh, of people were taking uh, substances. Uh, what about substances used to chief complaint directly due to the substance used? Um, that's so that's not the outer circle, but the middle circle compared to chief complaint. So, you know, this shows that your, your difference between the people that are using substances and are coming to see medical because of other things or they're coming to medical because of the substance itself is about a, a maybe a twofold difference. Right. So half of the people using substances are coming for that reason uh, in general. And again, there's only one one quote. So I don't have that many. Interestingly, this is the final one that I'm going to mention. And, and this is where uh, in 2018, it's just been just been published this January. Uh, this was an EDM festival in Belgium where there were 487 presentations to services. Um, they thought clinically 160 of them or 33% were due to substances. They took all those people and they went through uh, uh, blood and urine um, toxicology testing. Seven of those were negative. Those are people who are unconscious and, and had things that were clinically due to substance. So either our testing isn't very good or the <clears throat> uh, the medical causes, the non-toxicologic causes are actually more prevalent than we think. And so even our clinical acumen is uh, a bit suspect under these things. I'm just gonna come back briefly to music genre because I've spoken about the Westerall case of these 2.4 million, a really interesting uh, paper. Uh, essentially boiled it down to just a few things. The medical utilization rate, which is the same as our PPR, but per 10,000. So your, your risk of coming to services uh, is, only based according to their analysis on the genre of music plus was it a festival or not so did it have multiple stages uh, times a certain correction factor plus the heat index times a correction factor and that's presentations per hour uh, so it's interesting in that those are the those are what's boiled down to they weren't able to show statistical significance with only 4,000 patients I assume that's the reason anyways uh, but the genre you can see the genre gives a risk ratios and these are unadjusted now, but they give risk ratios relative to the median, which is hard rock of 1.00. You see that hip hop and dance, as we said, highest drug use on the top end. So it may be that drugs are not an independent predictor, but if you're gonna use genre as an independent predictor, that in fact, the drug utilization is included in that. A few last things about uh, um, mm -hmm. intoxication and substance use. Uh, on your patient presentations. So there's an overrepresentation of transports to hospital. So 73 of transports in one paper, uh, probably 11 of 11, it just wasn't mentioned, but the other three were like decreased level of consciousness and agitation. So it was probably 100% uh, were uh, substance related in terms of transports. 50% of the transports in uh, the SUI paper, 53 of 69, 77% of transports in this EDM in Belgium recently that's just published now. And then Westerall with the 2.4 million has said that transport rates are highest for alcohol and drug intoxicated patients, although the numbers aren't actually in the article. There is a significant burden on local health services. So, um, you know, look at Boonstock Festival in 2014 that we remember pretty well here. There's 80 transports in three days uh, because of uh, inability to care for people on site and, and the acuity of the care. Oxygen Festival in Ireland's quoted quite a number of times, 37 significant ED presentations in 24 hours. And then higher level care providers are preventing transports. We know that 73% of transports uh, prevented by first aid people transferring onto higher level of care and then those people being uh, treated and released. This is the last thing I'm gonna show just on, um, um, on the burden on local services. 
This is the Central Spike is Lollapalooza Festival. This is by weekend in Chicago area, pediatric hospital, presentations by uh, each, each week actually has two little graphs, well, one big graph in the middle, but um, so they each have two. And so it's drug related and alcohol related. You can see the spike related to alcohol related presentations to the emergency department on the weekend of Lollapalooza. And uh, it's incredible. You can show what, how that would uh, have an incredible effect on the services there. So managing people on site and decreasing harms in general and, and responsible drinking would be important. Overrepresentation of intoxication in deaths. I think this is the, the final, obviously the final uh, final pathway. 68 are, of all uh, music event deaths are due to overdose and poisoning in the past 15 years uh, going before 2014. And then 75 of 722 deaths at music events, sorry, at all mass gathering events in the academic and gray literature that was reviewed. So 10.4% um, were due to intoxication. And if you remove mass casualties and you remove traumas, it becomes a 75% cause of death, 75%. So, so outside of trauma and, and major catastrophes, the medical causes for death at festivals, uh, at mass gatherings in general, are intoxication. So what are the risks at uh, festivals? So they're direct. I mean, the toxic effects of the substance itself that can cause you to have a medical adverse event. And that could be a new onset event, like a seizure you never had, or that can be exacerbation of an existing condition, like you're a smoker and you have an asthma condition that exacerbated. Those are diff more difficult to, to capture. Obviously, you can have an overdose. And they can be indirect. So you have an altered sensorium, you have altered decision making. And so you can get heat related illness, you get predisposed to all these other things, heat related illness, trauma, so violence, homicide, accidental trauma, uh, self harm, suicide, mental health issues and psychological distress from being uh, on neurotransmitter enhancing substances throughout um, experiences and that can include even medical care. Um, and then uh, which can be distressing for a lot of people. Sexual health, uns uh, you know, you can have unsafe sex, you can have involuntary sex secondary to um, substance use and then communicable diseases, so sexual transmitted and bloodborne illness. And then finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about mass casualty later, but it's an important consideration um, at music festivals as well and the effects that intoxication can have, substance use can have on your ability to manage those. So substance use, again, altered case series, we're going to talk about what the common presentations are. Um, so I'm just going to talk about these two, which are both EDM events. And so this is our altered case series. So the common presentations for substance use that we saw, I just uh, reviewed altered mental status uh, with a colleague of mine. And um, we basically saw that, you know, behavioral, which was, you know, seizure, uh, sorry, uh, agitation or uh, hallucinations, bizarre behavior uh, or seizures or decreased level of consciousness accounted for a significant portion of uh, altered uh, patients. Now, I'm not talking pleasantly altered, but we're talking about GCS less than 14. Um, and so this, this is, these are essentially seizures, decreased level of consciousness or coma and agitation or, or hallucinations are a major component. And you can see that that's been replicated uh, in, in the 2018 paper of EDM stuff, which shows that the, the top presentations, this is all patients and in the brackets at the bottom, it tells you how many of them were transported. So these were high risk for transport, all these patients, 89 patients uh, in 2013, 30 were transferred and 71 in 2014, 23 were transferred. But so coma, agitation, convulsions, syncope, and then vomiting, abdominal pain, chest pain, palpitations, which are, you know, can, can are, again, could be sec could be indirect and, and are hard to, you're hard to tease out what the substance use implications of those kind of presentations are. Um, it, inebriation, uh, headache, hallucinations. And so uh, if you actually look at our AMS definition, altered mental status, it accounts for, uh, I, I believe, about 125 of these 160 patients. So there, there isn't really, we, we, so we're certainly, uh, these three presentations, uh, the top ones, coma agitation, convulsion, syncope, are probably the majority. Um, Self-reported uh, altered mental status, I just want to show that the drugs are related to these presentations even. So if you look at seizures and the size of the font is relative to their self-report, the number of times they self-reported overall through those patients. So seizure, MDMA pre predominance, decreased level of consciousness, alcohol, GHB and MDMA, behavioral, so agitation uh, and hallucinations, LSD, ketamine predominance. And if you then control for the decreased level of consciousness patients in the middle and look at who is transient, who had a prolonged um, 
uh, uh, versus who had a prolonged, you can see that on the top, GHB is really explaining your long and your your fluctuating courses of level of consciousness. And on the bottom, there, it's kind of independent. So transient is more likely to be syncope and that there's no real drug contributor. This is probably just background noise at a festival, to be honest, this amount of ketamine, cannabis, alcohol, et cetera. So again, you know, there, there are risks, right? Um, what, what are the substance related risks? And so um, for us, they're, they're direct risks, right? They're, they're overwhelming critical and toxic. Um, I think this is actually missed the heading. We're supposed to be mass casualties. So that's, that's, uh, that's the issue here. But so your, your direct for, sorry, uh, causes of mass casualty incidents are overwhelming critical intoxication presentations. That could be really bad drugs, a really bad batch of drugs. You have a lot of people down or a batch of really good drugs that a lot of people are taking and you have a lot of people down. Um, so that's your direct effect of the substance. Or you can have a criminal element that's there around uh, the fact that there's substance use uh, that causes a, a higher risk of a mass casualty incident. And then indirect. So you have a predisposition for the usual causes of, of MCIs, violence, you know, errors, crowd behavior, and now all of a sudden everybody's a little bit altered, or management of a usual one with intoxicated attendees, which I can tell you, my 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 flyer from this last year that was handed out uh, during during the evacuation alert that we had during the uh, um, electronic dance music event for wildfire, um, uh, made it very clear that people should stay sober, people should be ready to leave, and uh, I. I personally was not sure how to manage all of the folks uh, that were in my space, uh, given all of this. So it makes it a lot harder. All of the logistics become harder with a, a bunch of intoxicated people in the woods. So this is an important consideration for your MCI. Just the presence of those things alone make everything harder. The second part, mass gathering health. This is a bit of medical, public health, social science, all rolled into one. These are all the interesting spheres of uh, research, of involvement, of collaborators, of stakeholders that are involved. And that's why I think it's such a cool place uh, in a short space of, of several days to, to work together. Uh, as I said, metrics and outcomes we've discussed before. And so we want to talk about these outcomes, medical, uh, the metrics on the left, outcomes on the right that we care about, including our po new post event idea. And I'm going to bring this within the event chain of survival. So this is a, a bit of a framework that was proposed by um, um, uh, some researchers here from Canada. And uh, the, the framework is to, it was a research framework initially, uh, but the idea is to, to use it to improve outcomes at planned events. And so we have these six uh, different uh, silos. And so on the left side are the proactive folks. These are the event organizers, policing and security, festival health, and I'll put proactive and in, 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 in reactive as the next in, in quotes, because they, they do have option. Uh, they're not just reactive or proactive. They do have other responsibilities, but they're generally more of a planning phase and a proactive, and that's on the injury and illness prevention front, the health promotion front, the harm reduction front, and the crowd resiliency front. So how to make sure that 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 essentially, um, and I'll, I'll just skip to this for this, this explanation, but essentially it's their job to stop this PPR. And so we want, we want to stop presentations to us and those negative, uh, those, 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 those harms that come from the risky behavior. The other interesting thing is that you know the festival, um, uh, the the festival health services. That third link also follow up after when you're off event. And so I think this is a great uh, example of talking about the population health potential of of working on site uh, from a from a public health uh, standpoint. And then so I'm just going to go back quickly here to this. Uh, so this is the other side of things: are reactive, and it's essentially on site medical services, ambulance services, and off site services. And and we need to consider is your personnel. Who, What's your skill? What are you, what are you going to provide? What kind of services? How are you going to do the equipment? And what are you going to train? What are you going to prepare for? And these are the two things I'm just going to talk about quickly here. The overarching principles for all this at music festivals, I think, uh, um, bear consideration. I've got a couple of of the references down down at the bottom, but essentially did a lit review and looked at all mentions of potential uh, ways in which we can prevent harms uh, uh, in the literature. And there have been some some work done here in Canada that was facilitated by uh, the folks who did the chain of survival concept as well, which I, I'd, I'd like to uh, give a huge shout out to because I think it's a great uh, framework for getting things done. And I think it's a, a, a document that uh, provides a basis for a lot of things that are really important for a music festival health. But the overarching principles are that you should be accepting and non-judging of the people uh, at the at the festival. It's super important because these are youth and these are people who are in a recreational environment and it can't be 
overdone in terms of your intervention has to be peer delivered and outreach outreach based and those are the really the the effective strategies for uh uh, for for basically uh, engaging with with the people and uh, and discussing the the the, uh, the issues that are um, uh, uh, that are important. It's collaborative, so all these silos and all these different services are working together. They work pre, during, and post event on uh, iterative uh, improvement after and on planning and working together with a shared philosophy and a shared uh, common goal, mutual respect. And then uh, they also get involved in research, which uh, is fun sometimes. And then experience-based is how a lot of these have come along. So it's based on experience at, at festivals that have existed or, or, or mass gatherings that have existed. And now it's becoming a bit more evidence-based, which I think is great. And the final comment is just absent of focus is not effective, especially at these festivals. And so it's worth mention, but it's not an effective strategy for uh, reducing harms uh, on a large scale. I want to talk about education uh, because I think that's the main activity that's in, in, in most projects. It's ineffective alone, according to the literature, uh, beyond providing people health literacy. And so you have to have multiple methods of educating folks and services separated in time. And I think this is uh, an important consideration. Education can happen through signage on event. It can come through direct engagement and outreach, as I mentioned, through peers. It can have social media involvement, which I'm, uh, I'm becoming older and less... Uh, uh, less good at, and so certainly the youth are are uh, going to be doing a good job of social media um, uh, learning and uh, and uh, providing education through that means is probably now the number one I would expect way to reach people. Uh, postcard stickers and documents also great need to be in the format that are that is um, uh, relative to the the uh, the the population of, of interest, and then uh, essentially this lit review uh, it's it hasn't fully come together, so it's still a work in progress. Hopefully the the a part of a follow-up for the music portion of the um, public health considerations due to people's motivations um, that uh, that uh, was shown earlier uh, that Ali spearheaded with uh, Jimmy Rancy. Um, this, um, uh, you know, these are considerations. I'm just going to kind of run through them, and I apologize they're not the the, the cleanest or the most complete, um, but the things to consider. So, from an education perspective, uh, these are, uh, you know, this is a, a non-exhaustive list, but of things you might want to think about if you're in a pre preparatory mode from a public health perspective in terms of the education things you might do or or need to to, to access. So, facilitating attendee contact for everybody through the through access to the to attendee data or, or contacts. We want to promote a festival philosophy and the norms. And as I said, the motivations for coming to the festival are shaped by the media representation of the festival itself. So, the festival has uh, uh, an important role in in shaping behaviors by by uh, giving a giving a representation of what it is that their festival is about, right? Which for good or for worse. They might share a code of conduct. They might emphasize personal responsibility to people. They might have a plan for driving impaired folks and, and educate people about that. Um, they might publicize event safety services, which I think is super important so people know how to access those and what is actually available on site. There are some environmental considerations as well. That So I've just sort of grouped these uh, uh, education, environmental, and supplies and, and training as the four. Um, and so the second environmental, you know, things you might do, you might provide free water, limit food and drink prices so that people hydrate and, and eat properly and, and prevent the negative effects of that. You might have a plan for the legal substances, limiting alcohol. Um, uh, you might have a plan for minors, system for public messaging, noise, um, you know, limit music hours, make specific spaces. Uh, those are all environmental things that would be in design and upfront uh, that would allow you to, as an event promoter, to consider the public health implications and all the things that are tools that might be at your disposal that you might not necessarily be aware of. Uh, also, the presence of specific services. So focus on local community group partnerships, and that and that's from from the perspective of being able to follow up post event, but also um, just on having people who are good at what they do. Uh, mobile peer teams are important to check on people. Drug checking services uh, and the, the uh, inherent controversies are worth discussing and, and looking at. Substance-free zone, um, women's safe space, psychedelic support, all these things are things that uh, we're hoping to give a bit more information in a final version of this. And then supplies, so things for noise, things for sexual health, things for heat and sun, things for substance use. And then training. So, what do we? What could we train the staff in? A responsible beverage, um, you know, serving things. Uh, that be that would be sort of a, a baseline thing. Uh, intoxication, first response. Uh, how to notify emergency services. How to locate on site. These are all things that you should consider. Might not 
see as instrumental in decreasing the harms of substance use at a festival. So what about the medical side? So we've talked a bit about the, the, the stopping PPRs through interventions on a, on a sort of um, uh, intervention, uh, you know, sort of uh, planning scale and services scale. Uh, on the medical side of things, when we're talking about the, uh, the reactive or, or right side of medical services, just to recap, we know that substance use increases our presentations, increases acuity, ambulance need, hospital utilization, MCI risk, deaths so what can we do to like hack out these things including the 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 poor little guy with his x'd out eyes that didn't make it after the festival um because i i think those are important it's not just preventive but these are also things that we can be better at in order to minimize the harms once something comes to a higher risk so i think you need to determine your objectives in terms of your medical response so are you wanting to provide critical care or first aid uh, what's the spectrum that you'd like to do? What's your budget? What's your comfort in providing a higher level of care and the liability with that? What's your capacity to do that with personnel, equipment, training, those kind of things? And from that, you get your needs in terms of your personnel, your equipment, and your training. Uh, what kind of cases do you see? I'm sorry, I've got a double slide here. But so, you know, if you want to know what to prepare for, you, you need to, again, review coma, seizure, agitated, inebriated patients, chest pain, syncope, abdominal pain, headache, trauma, dehydration, allergy, all the usual stuff that you see at a, a music festival independently of substance use, but with the substance use ones first and foremost to prevent those harms. Also, what might you see from a critical care perspective? Arrests, aspirations, hyponatremia, hyperthermia with, with ecstasy and some of the novel substances. And again, these are gonna dictate your needs in terms of your, uh, your personnel and, and preparation. So personnel, normal care models, basically the, the one proposed previously, uh, higher level of care model where first aiders see, higher level care providers provide where needed, the higher triage acuity scale numbers, and then those move on to a regional health center. It's generally a pyramid kind of, you know, uh, MD nurse, paramedic, first aiders with more folks for the lower acuity stuff, uh, the minor. And then, you know, numbers, you know, you can model that if you can, but probably the six of a thousand that was proposed by Krull. Uh, in electronic dance music, uh, that kind of seminal paper, 2012, um, is a good place to start. And uh, if you got a bit high numbers, you're probably going to be uh, hopping. And if you got a bit low numbers, you'd be a little overstaffed. But it's a good way to start. Otherwise, you got to wait for future PDM issues where we're, they're, it's going to be published. What skills do you need? Well, if you're going to be managing substance abuse, uh, substance use harms, uh, you're going to need airway skills, ALS skills, transport skills, critical care skills, mental health skills, clinical talks, uh, clinical toxicology, emergency, and trauma. In addition to all the usual things that you need to be radio savvy, uh, triage, um, you need to be good at, and then you need to be fun and flexible, and you need to be able to deal with 90% feet and, and IV uh, hydration at the end of the day, because this is a music festival that isn't all those things, um, but we're going to prepare for them anyways. From an equipment Point of view, I've kind of dumbed it down a little bit from the sense of it's uh, it's not this simple, but th these are the common things where uh, that the top five are sort of the common presentations. The top, the bottom four are the are the sort of critical care presentations. What do you need? I mean, for a coma, you need oxygen. You need to be able to manage an airway. You need monitors. You need suction. You need to be able to do an iStat to rule out hyponatremia, and uh, you need to be able to do a glucose. And you need to have those to replete if you have them, glucose and, and hypertonic saline. Seizure, you need the same thing as a coma, but you need to restrain them if they're you know, disoriented and you need benzos to treat them. If they're agitated, you need the same as a seizure, plus you need some antipsychotics, maybe, or some ketamine for the really bad cases. The inebriation, same as coma. Chest pain, syncope, you need the same as coma. You generally don't have to restrain those folks. You need an ECG, aspirin, benzos. And then arrests, aspiration, all these kind of higher level things. ALS meds, for arrest, you might want to consider having intralipid or esmol on hand for the the potential hail mary benefit it can give if you did have something that was significant tox arrest and then uh, aspiration oxygen airway hyponatremia same as coma as i've already discussed and hyperthermia need to be able to cool people with mist fans ice packs do it quickly i think uh you need to prepare people it's more of a training issue to identify that that's a risk so finally, training. And again, I've identified what the cases are that you need to be trained for to manage them. Uh, this past year, I created some modules to uh, prepare the people at the festival for these. Um, and I think this is important. Uh, I know Friedman in his discussion of the deaths following the New York City issues that they had um, uh, after I think it was Mad Decent uh, um, 
party, uh, the Mad Decent Festival, um, they basically did some additional training to decrease their their uh, to, to decrease their poor outcomes after. And this was one of the things they focused on the specific training for the medical personnel. And I think I think this is sort of the future of uh, where we should be going because we need to be prepared for these things. So the, the concepts that I'm uh, focused on were uh, aspiration and basic airway management, uh, altered mental status, uh, decreased level of consciousness, uh, hot and altered. So that's your, uh, your hyperthermic uh, MDMA classic case or, or lots of other things, obviously. Uh, opiates and naloxone. So for the fentanyl crisis, um, just general club toxicology, understanding uh, your, your, um, um, your toxidromes and what these substances physically do and look like. Uh, how to find your patients quickly, because it can be as simple as a minute or, or two difference can, can make the, the difference in somebody's life. So this really is chain of survival stuff. Uh, and, and we're proud to say we've been really working hard to get to people as quickly as possible, uh, which you wouldn't consider a public health thing, but but it really is uh, uh, really is across the spectrum. And then uh, finally, on-scene critical intervention. So uh, cardiac arrest, if you arrive at a cardiac arrest, what are your considerations? And then taking from the trauma combat casualty care model, how to arrive quickly, how to do the essentials on scene as quickly and efficiently as possibly uh, for, as possible for the ABCs, and then how to get uh, back to definitive care. So in conclusion, at music festival, substance use increases risks of harm, injury, and illness. The use of medical services follows some known patterns, but there's still a relative, a relative, a relative paucity of research on uh, music festival specifically within the mass gathering literature. Substance related presentations at on-site medical services are on the whole predictable and manageable with appropriate training and preparation. Medical services are but one of the ways to mitigate these risks. And I should have star, star, star this because I think that's really important, especially from people coming from the medical side of things as we often forget about all these other things. And that's kind of one of the bees in my bond is to focus on that. Collaborative planning that promotes specific interventions, including multi-pronged education campaigns, environmental design, and well-trained and equipped on-site services has the potential to minimize potential harms. Research on the direct impact of the interventions is building. So they aren't, they aren't all evidence-based. Um, they're experiential, but that's coming, I, I believe. And uh, the care of potentially critically ill attendees on-site remains a liability, quote, discomfort, and an opportunity for the development of clearer guidelines promoting safety and protection. That's that. We're right on time, 47, not too bad. And I, yeah, I would uh, open to any questions and thank you so much for your attention. That was uh, fun. <laughs> uh, th thank you, Brendan. That was really comprehensive and really informative. And I'm very impressed that you got through 76 slides in about 45 minutes. Um, we're gonna open it up to questions here. And if you wanna use the uh, raise hand feature the icon next to your name, um, we can call on you, unmute your microphone, and you can ask uh, Brendan uh, a question. Um, so if anyone is uh, willing to be the uh, first one here, um, I can go ahead and unmute your microphone, and we can uh, start a discussion here. Well, I did have one while we're waiting for questions. I had one email to me from uh, from a gentleman named Michael Hammond, and he had asked, what is the best first-line treatment for a suspected drug, drug overdose during a concert? Uh, that's a great question. I, I think... Um... You know, that's uh, it's, it's, it's as big as you want that question to be. The, the reality is, I mean, I, I think obviously you're going to focus on a to toxidromes and ABCs to get most value for your money. Um, I think what, I, what I'd like to uh, focus on is not giving people things willy-nilly just because you think it's a, an intoxication. So the, the, the days of giving nalo the, you know, naloxone, uh, dextrose to everybody are kind of gone. And I, I think we're at the point where uh, the supportive management should be what we should be focusing on, teaching basic airway, uh, teaching um, uh, assessment and correction of abnormal vitals. Because I think a lot of the basic things, if I had to say one thing about uh, all the modules that were pr pr proposed and, and the, the issues in them is that 
we do basic really badly. And so my, my first my first approach to that person would be just first aid recovery position. Uh, if they're vomiting, clear their airway. These are all, they all sound silly. We, people want to do the big interventions and, you know, put a tube in and get them on a ventilator and give them, you know, whatever, whatever antidote and, you know, uh, but the truth is the things that are going to make a difference for that person in the short term are, are, are the simple things that we don't often think about or, or even do well. Um, and a lot of us don't even have our, our, our personnel as well need that review. They need those things um, um, sort of, um, you know, redrilled. And, and that's, what, that's what the focus is for, for us to try and make sure that if people, number one, recognize and number two, are doing the appropriate thing to fix that, that they're not making things worse, like they're not messing around in somebody's airway who's unconscious and causing them to vomit. Um, or giving them, you know, naloxone, and it was a combined overdose of of an opiate and a, you know, a, a, a cocaine or, or an amphetamine that now they have a seizure because you've given them the naloxone or they vomit. Uh, so I think the first do no harm is a great way to start. ABCs is a great way to start. Simple is a great way to start, and um, and, and and go from there. Those are the first things I would do. Okay, we got a question from. Glenn Ellis, um, he's got his hand raised. So Glenn, I'm gonna go ahead and unmute your microphone and you can ask your question. Uh, just give me one moment. Okay, Glenn, go ahead and ask your question. Hi guys. Uh, Brennan, that's a great talk. Thanks very, very much, very interesting. Just a question from Thanks, my man. perspective. With the data that you've produced, or you've you've uh, excellent data, numbers of rapid sequence inductions at festivals, as they have a knock-on effect for local resources in respect of ICU beds, so forth. Is there any data with the number of RCIs that have RSIs that have been done at some of the festivals you've spoken about? I, I, everybody who knows me is gonna gonna wonder whether this was a planted question because with my <laughs> anesthesia back, this is exactly the thing I'm actually the most interested in, in trying to get some literature to support what we do if we're conservative about it uh, or when when to pull the trigger if we're not conservative about it. And so uh, uh, looking at the festival literature, there are very few uh, intubations. Um, I think there, there are there was one reported uh, in the 2016 Friedman paper. Um, you know, there's a smattering of ones that I remember seeing reported, but uh, there's, there's no numerator denominator on that that I can give you at all. Uh, I can tell you from our perspective, again, the focus on basic airway and the question of, especially in an austere or remote environment like we are, where we're an hour and a half from a hospital, the issue of in, uh, intubating intoxicated patients is super uh, yeah, um, controversial and, and charged. And so the risks of exposing people to that are uh, weighed against the risks of not doing that and, and us being responsible for an aspiration. Um, so... This is a, a, a subject of future research because I think there's emerging evidence that despite full stomachs, uh, most people who are unconscious do fine as long as you don't manipulate them. And uh, at, at the risk of sounding really cowboy, um, that's the basic uh, premise of management on site of people without intubation. Um, but uh, but into, there is a role for intubation and the line between those things I think needs to be delineated. And I'm re I would really like to work with people who work at other festivals to try and get our numbers up in terms of the management of that. So that's one of my major goals. And the beauty of that is also, uh, as I've explained to some of my other collaborators and, and colleagues, that this is, this is the potential for us to inform emergency medicine from the mass gathering perspective where um, in an intoxication in an emergency department, they often get a tube for, for better or for worse, whether it's necessary or not in that environment, it's a different environment for sure. But there may be a potential for us to develop a set of guidelines or rules that can, can inform a much larger uh, segment of practice in, in uh, tertiary care or even rural, rural uh, locations where they do that in regular departments. Okay, we have another uh, uh participant who has their hand raised here. Uh, Kevin, I'm, I'm going to apologize in advance if I mispronounce anyone's last name. Uh, Kevin Hanrahan, uh, I'm going to go, go ahead and unmute your microphone if you'd like to go ahead and ask your question. You there, Kevin? Roger that. 
You hear me? Hi, Kevin. Yep. Hi, Brandon. You are a cowboy in my eyes, by the way. Thanks for a great <laughs> presentation. Thanks, I had a simple, a simple question and then probably a more difficult one. The simple one was you said uh, you like to have first daters in the amount of six per thousand, but your slide said six per 10,000. I'm assuming it's the former because uh, I'm trying to imagine six first daters with 10,000 people and it's scaring me. But uh, if you can answer that. And the second one is how do you plan for evacuating a, <clears throat> a town, a fairly large town in an expedient manner when that town took six or eight or 12 hours to get inside your venue and now all of them are incapable of actually transporting themselves outside of town due to inebriation of some kind. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so I may have said a thousand. Uh, I I don't recognize. I don't try to remember what was on my slide, but I, I believe it's ten thousand because it's not. It, it's your number of presentations, and I, I'm just going from my own experience. Where when I started at the festival seven eight years ago, there was only about nine of us or so that were managing fifteen thousand people, and it was it was hopping. And it's a festival that has a pretty high acuity and volume, um, but I think it's manageable. I don't think it's a a bad point to start from um and so if i i'm not sure how i said it but but i think six per ten thousand i would have to check the reference um but i think six per ten six per ten thousand of medical like i think they say trained professionals and so i wouldn't say first aiders i think you have to have a mix of some other people but oh, one of those six was definitely a physician for a ten thousand you know edm festival no question um so i hope that answers your question in terms of yeah in terms of evacuation this is my first experience with um, you know, uh, disaster management at an EDM. Uh, I normally just do the medical direction bit. And um, it was uh, supremely stressful because uh, the, the crowd mood um, was completely different. People were not grabbing their stuff and running for the hills or rioting yet, but you could feel that it was not far from that. There was a lot of intoxications. There's a lot of people that um, um, just have different risk <laughs> tolerances than me. And so that that paper went out and I was still all night getting people that were, you know, Glasgow coma scale of five coming in. And I just couldn't understand how somebody could do that with the alerts and those things going on knowing that. But I guess that's the beauty of trying to understand behavior sometimes is that, uh, uh, you know, it's it's uh, sometimes it's just the outside. That's what, that's what, that's why you have interest in these things because uh, they're interesting. In terms of moving those people out in that in expeditious manner, uh, there there isn't a great way. The the idea was to to allow the fire to get to a perimeter where um, where it would be more time than at least we we knew they knew it would take us to 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 evacuate. And uh, the difficulty was that there were uh, there were some political lines that only allowed it to be declared at one hour, and we needed more than one hour. And so it got into a bit of a tug of war because the the because of the just just because of the definitions and the actual lines in the sand made it hard to make a decision. Um, but yeah, I think I think I'm going to be honest that the people who managed it from a disaster medicine side of things and and from a emergency operations management really knew their limitations, knew what we were capable of, and I I I actually do think the festival would be uh, in that case would be able to move things out. Um, in the time that they said it wouldn't be an hour, it wouldn't be two hours. But if they said it was going to be six hours, I, I do believe that that those lines were reasonable and that nobody was was making up numbers uh, that that would have put lives at risk. And in the end, actually, there's a uh, the, one of the issues is getting over a river that they put a, a temporary bridge in over, uh, which I, I can't imagine as a pinch point is about four feet wide and fifteen thousand people going over that with flames chasing them would have been something to see. But anyways, okay, thanks so we much, have Kevin. Kevin. Uh, we have one other participant who has their hand raised, uh, Haddon Rab. Uh, Haddon, I'm going to go ahead and unmute your microphone. You there? Oh, yeah, sorry. I uh, hit that by accident. Um, okay, so you don't have a question then? Um, no, sorry. Uh, no problem. Uh, so we have several people who have uh, sent questions in. Um, rather than raising hands. So I'm going to read a few of these if you have a few more minutes, Brendan. Absolutely. OK, so the first question I have here is, how do you get the public, uh, excuse me, how do you get the medical slash public health side involved in the mass gathering planning process? Um, 
okay, if I understand, if I understand the, the question, you say medical public health side uh, in, in, the mass the gathering, in the mass gathering, in the mass gathering as a whole. I, I, I mean, I, I'm not sure, I'm not sure I fully understand my, I think part of the difficulty is that everybody works in silos, right? And so whether it's, now we're talking about music festivals and it's a mass gathering stream and some of this is applicable, some of it isn't, some of us talk together, some of us don't. And the public health folks, it, it depends on, again, whether public health is at the top of your uh, your operations diagram or public health is off uh, one box on the bottom right hand corner. And I think the truth is the more we look at things as a, as a, as a, uh, you know, as a, a horizontal thing where we communicate well. Um, that's something I've learned from, from the festival work that I've done, where you come in as a medical director with your needs and wants, and and um, you you start to appreciate everybody else's uh, ability to 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 work collaboratively, but also have their own limits and and, and um, uh, responsibilities. So, in terms of bringing that into mass gatherings. I think, I, I, in my experience through WADM, I think everybody here is already in a public health mass gathering capacity because uh, we all we all do have uh, some of the skills that transfer across, and the the different the different groups that come to the table with pretty much everything uh, really do represent the spectrum of public health services. If you do the capital mass gathering health or capital public health at the top of the diagram, so. I, I, I'm not sure that we don't do that well, and and if I if I can clarify better, let me know. And um, Rona, if, can I just jump in? I think it's really important to recognise that it's about having conversations too, and recognising that um, many people bring different perspectives to events, and the more we talk to different people, the more we have an opportunity to collaborate. And over. <laughs> Okay, we, we have a, several people have asked questions about the uh, modules, the online training modules that were um, mentioned in the presentation. Um, people are wondering how that how they could go about accessing those. Uh, are those uh, publicly accessible? They're they're not currently publicly accessible. There's a there's a uh, uh, sort of a plan to to share those, whether it's informally or formally. Um, and um, that's something I, I'd be happy to be contacted about. And um, um, yeah, they, they they were super fun, but a ton of work. So so um, I, I think it'd be uh, it'd, it'd be great to talk to some people who are interested in using them in terms of their context and what it's going to be used for. And and uh, yeah, it would be a great great way to hopefully get some collaboration as well. Okay. Um could we include your contact details and in, in an email for people to follow up with you regarding the modules? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, well, we'll go ahead and do that. Um, and then sometime later today or tomorrow, we'll send a, an email out to the participant list here and let them know how they can get in touch with you. Uh, we have another question about um, peak hours for presentation. Uh, this individual is asking, are there more uh, between 6 p.m. and midnight, or from midnight to 6 a.m. Sure, that uh, I, I can only speak to the data at our festival. I, I don't have others uh, uh, at my disposal. I'm compared, but I, there, I know it's bimodal at our festival, generally speaking. So the presentations start around uh, around eight or nine in the evening, and they peak at about two or three in the morning until six in the morning. Uh, and so it's a it's a five day festival where. Uh, where there's almost 24 hours of music. There's only a couple hours of quiet between sort of 8 and 10 in the morning. Um, and then there's another that picks up in the afternoon. It's a smaller, it's a smaller peak, but it's, uh, it's around 4 or 5, uh, sort of between 4 and 6 and 7, something like that maybe. Um, and uh, we're not, we're, I've been interested in trying to figure out what that is, if that's people that are waking up from the night or if that's heat-related um illness or if there's another factor that i'm not aware of but um that that's been my experience and certainly for an outdoor uh electronic dance music festival i expect that it's probably something that we could see elsewhere because it's probably a reflection of behavior and uh, environment more than anything else and we have another question that 
is somewhat similar to that. Um, and this question is asking, how far past a festival's end should a medical presence be maintained in your experience? Um, uh, my experience is generally longer than I planned for. Uh, and my experience through, through the electronic dance music side of things is that the, the exit is actually the, the hardest. I don't, I don't, again, I don't know. I haven't worked a whole lot of other festivals, but the exit people are, people are completely depleted and burnt. People's neurotransmitters are totally destroyed from the like sleep deprivation, stimulation and drugs. And so, um, exit day is always kind of psychiatry and troubleshooting and trying to get people. It's a bit of police. It's a bit of, um, uh, you know, uh, involuntary forming people and medicating folks and then also managing the logistics of, you know, of getting people out through a difficult access in a remote location at this particular festival. So um, I think it depends on the length of, of your uh, event. So for, you know, a day or two, I don't think you need to be, if it's a day or two festival, you don't need to be there for two days after. Uh, but I do know that, that the, the, I think I would be on the long end of things when I say that what we do is probably on the long end of things. And that's that music shuts down on a uh, Monday morning at 10 AM after being on since Thursday and people are allowed to stay until Tuesday afternoon. So 24 hours to sleep for driving safety. And then, then they leave. So generally by Tuesday evening, you know, 90 people, 90% of people are, are off site. And my experience has been when I leave before that Tuesday evening that I still have things to deal with, uh, whether it's GHB intoxication on Tuesday afternoon uh, or people unconscious just this past year at midnight on Monday night, uh, well after the, you know, 12 hours after they're still partying after the music stopped, uh, or even on the Wednesday after uh, that people got left because this was the fire issue. People stayed longer than usual because uh, there were just extenuating circumstances. So I, I don't have a clear answer for that. I don't just want to give you one experience, but I but I do know that um, that I think you should always taper down later than you expect. And if your experience the follow uh, if you have a, a next year to, to 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 realize you had too much, then scale it back. But um, um, it makes it very difficult for other services if you're not around to deal with some of those complicated patients. Okay, um, we have just a few more questions here. Um, do you have a few more minutes, Brendan? Yeah, no problem. Okay, so uh, we have another question here that is asking how important is it to early warn hospitals to uh, reduce morbidity and mortality? Yeah, I've seen I've seen a fair amount of that in the literature in terms of surveillance and you know real time updating every four hours, giving the hospital, you know what your numbers are, what things are looking like. Um, I I think it I think it depends on what your ability to treat on site is and what the volume you're seeing is, and I I think a lot of it has to do with goodwill with the hospital. I think it's always good to have connections with them. I think it's always good if you've had a bad connection with them to be doing that to get back in good books if, if things have been overloaded and they're unhappy with you. Um, the actual utility of that, I, I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not certain exactly. It would depend entirely on your numbers. But for me to be informing them of the you know, two transports a day or whatever it was I'm doing is not a good use of anybody's time. They would prefer probably not to pick up the phone. So um, I think there's utility in it. Uh, I'm not sure where it lies or how often it needs to be updated or how much infrastructure needs to be invested in providing it. Um, but I, I don't I don't see anything in the literature that gives any uh, indication of the value other than it being interesting and nice to do and, and a, you know, a nice thing for those people and, and like a cool technological new thing to do. But in terms of clinical utility and operational utility, I, I don't